Welcome to another broadcast of the North Carolina Masonic Research Society. And we are thrilled to have back again the incomparable Mitch Horowitz. Uh, Mitch has blown us away with all of his previous presentations. Um, and tonight will be no exception. Reclaiming the Damned. Uh, I, have, I have been looking forward to this for over a month. I can't tell you how excited I am. Um, Mitch really needs no introduction for folks on here, but... Uh, for those that will be viewing this later, Mitch is an author in residence at the New York Public Library in Manhattan, a lecturer in residence at the Philosophical uh, Society in Los Angeles, as well as many other accolades and awards, very uh, accomplished author, television personality, uh, has written many, many magazine articles, which I truly enjoy reading and absorbing. So, Mitch, again, it's just a thrill to have you back, my friend, and, and uh, love to hear the presentation. And you're muted. You're here tonight, and uh, my thanks to uh, Matt Parker and, and Joe Martinez of the uh, North Carolina Masonic Research Society for facilitating these evenings. Uh, this has become something of a regular exchange for us. And it's just an incredible pleasure to be able to get together and, and communicate and have an exchange in this kind of an atmosphere, especially today when so many of us are either confined to our homes or kept from traveling and engaging in the things that we ordinarily engage in. And it's wonderful that, that we're able to find uh, this way you know, to, to, to be together. And this has proven over these past uh, several weeks to be such a, a rich and wonderful uh, environment for seekers to exchange ideas. Uh, thanks also to Josh Romero, who was able to join us, who's responsible for the wonderful graphics. Uh, so, uh, a welcome to all of you and uh, my appreciation for your all being here uh, on this Halloween Eve presentation of Reclaiming the Damned. Now, <clears throat> the title of this talk, Reclaiming the Damned, is a tribute uh, to the great paranormal investigator, the pioneering paranormal writer, Charles Fort, uh, whose first book in uh, 1919 was entitled The Book of the Damned. And uh, Fort saw what he called the damned or damned facts as things that were excluded from the canon of accepted knowledge and discourse. And it was Ford's contention that as materialist science uh, grew wholly dominant in Western society in the late 19th, early 20th century, for all the good and all the positive advances that it brought to bear on the human situation, it also contained with it a kind of orthodox, if not authoritarian tone that excluded anything, any facts, any damned facts, as Ford put it, that didn't mesh with its paradigm. And its basic paradigm, and this holds true to this day in the 21st century, the basic paradigm of materialism as a philosophy is that matter creates itself. That you and I and all things that we see is self-created through chemical processes, uh, bereft of anything that we would refer to as intelligence or consciousness other than as an epiphenomenon of the brain. And you'll hear all the time, and I'll address this in this evening's uh, presentation, um, ardently materialist uh, scientists or activists who refer to themselves as skeptics uh, maintaining that there's no evidence for non-local intelligence. There's no evidence for something that we would call consciousness uh, that goes outside of the five senses. And in fact, uh, the mind is compared to the bubbles that appear in a glass of carbonated water. And when the physical apparatus of the brain, the water, let's say, is gone, the bubbles are gone. And that's it. No question of after-death survival. No question of extrasensory or anomalous intelligence. No question of transfer of information between different groups of people in ways that exceed the 
physical, physically understood uh, senses. All these things are completely unaccepted. And, and then of course, there's the broader question of phenomena. The persistence of UFO sightings, now the concrete documentation of UFO sightings, something that's been around for a long time, but that we now have evidence of that's so overwhelmingly compelling, no intellectually serious person could dismiss the UFO thesis. We don't know what UFOs are, and I'm gonna talk about that as well tonight, but it's no longer tenable at this point in 2020 to dismiss the UFO thesis. It might've been tenable 18 months ago, but with the Pentagon's official release of cockpit recordings, cockpit videos of UFO phenomena, material that was available previously in leaked form, but that now has been released with the full approbation of the DOD and the DOD's, the Department of Defense's announcement that it's, it's, it's undertaking a whole new project for the study of UFO phenomena Whatever else one connects with that announcement, the very fact of that announcement is such that UFOs and there is no closing that door. If nothing else, it's been a terrible year for us all, you know, with COVID and everything else. But if nothing else, we can say, I think that uh, 2019, 2020 was the year in which a UFO phenomena went mainstream. Talk of little green men or just mistakes or illusions or natural phenomena that's mistaken as artificial phenomena. By artificial, I mean uh, phenomena that, uh, that is, 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 is uh, engineered rather than just apparent you know, from nature. Um, to use any of those dismissals is now outdated. It's unserious, it's untenable, it's embarrassing. So I'm not sure quite whether UFO phenomena can be uh, called a damned fact anymore, as Charles Fort would have used the uh, phrase. Although there's still a, a lot of denial over uh, UFOs. Eventually we'll call it UFO denialism. You know, it'll be a school that maybe it won't have its own page on Wikipedia anytime soon, considering the materialist prejudices of Wikipedia, but it's justifiable. Um, UFOs as a study are now uh, legitimate and legitimized in a way that I think uh, is unique to, to, to our particular time. I think we are also on the precipice of new approaches to other kinds of anomalous phenomena, like the persistent testimony of mysterious or anomalous beasts. Uh, like the pursuit and question of extraterrestrial life. You know, when I was a kid, as with many of you, you know, if you talked about the prospect of there being life on Mars or life on Venus, both of which are distinct possibilities, albeit in some cases in a microbial form. But if you were to talk about such things, that would be considered fantasy. And today, these are, again, very mainstream inquiries. The question of microbial life on Mars, the question very recently of some form of um, what might be considered primeval life on Venus, uh, the existence of water on the moon. A generation ago, this stuff would have been considered just pure fantasy. You would have been run out of any serious discussion for bringing it up. And today, of course, these things are facts. So as we're coming to understand the general nature of life, the general nature of life, as opposed to just being this strictly earthbound phenomena, I think that too cracks open the door to us taking a second look, us as a society, taking a second look at the question in the presence of anomalous forms of life, mysterious beasts, humanoid forms, alushes or leprechauns or call it what you will, other forms of life that have been persistent in testimony from time immemorial and continue to be so, and yet that testimony has been regarded as a damned fact in Fort's term. We might be turning a door on that. And last and finally, we might be turning a door um, on the study of ESP phenomena or psychical phenomena, a field that I care very, very deeply about 
as some of you who follow my work know. And I'll talk more about that as well. I published an article this week called The Man Who Destroyed Skepticism about the career and legacy of the famous skeptic, professional skeptic, polemical skeptic, uh, James Randi, who died last week. And I felt it was uh, very important to memorialize a dissent uh, to the uh, manner in which Randy's career was being assessed. Um, as those of you who follow the news are aware, uh, after uh, his passing at age 92 last week, there appeared a flood of entirely unqualified tributes and eulogies uh, to the man in media all over the world places from you know, opinion, opinion shaping media. New York Times, NPR, The Guardian, new tributes as if to say, you know, here was the man who helped us to think better. Here was the man who helped us to understand that psychics and uh, uh, claimants of psychical abilities was all bosh. Nobody needed to trouble themselves with it for a moment, take a second look at it. Or, and certainly we as a society at our college campuses should never consider sustaining or funding academic research into such matters, however inexpensive that funding may actually be. And I felt that on many counts, on many counts, Randy's career was terribly uh, negative insofar as he mocked and ridiculed the work of legitimate clinicians, some living, some dead, who strove in conservative, juried, academically structured environments to study the anomalous transfer of ESP in laboratory settings. I value these studies tremendously. And, 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 and one of the reasons I value these studies is because if you can statistically establish a transfer of information or some kind of communication within a clinically structured laboratory setting that supersedes what we understand as ordinary sensory experience, then you have, in essence, poked a hole in the philosophy of materialism once and for all, once and for all, and determined that humanity has some sort of extra physical existence as we have a physical existence. And I would contend there are other fields and other sciences, including neuroplasticity, including elements of quantum theory that likewise poke holes in materialism. And yet the partisans of materialism, and Randy was, I think, probably the most street fighting and in many regards unethical among them, unethical because he smeared, name called, ridiculed, instead of permitting the sustenance of questions and a whole generation of self-styled skeptics followed in his footsteps, not many of them scientists, activists, and they're very effective. They're effective because their means are repetition, um, a willingness and proclivity towards absolute language, and a campaign-like um, effort, a coordinated choral campaign-like effort against anyone who seeks to explore the persistence of a so-called damned fact, regardless of how responsibly, conservatively, or in how scholarly a way that exploration occurs. No difference is made. That person, whether a clinician, a physician, or just someone like me, you know, a writer who claims no such title, who just explores something or reports on something, who doesn't echo 100% of their outlook, um, is uh, vociferously uh, pushed back at 
Um, and the result has been a hounding of uh, a great deal of psychical research off most of our college campuses today. We've lost about 30 years of progress. So this kind of polemical skepticism has been influential, has been powerful. It's not the product of any one person, although certainly a lot of the self-styled skeptics, which in the article that I referenced, I would maintain many of them are pseudo-skeptics, which is to say those who seek to uh, judge without investigation, uh, those who seek to bring a kind of disproportion to all these discussions and lump everybody together as if there's no scale of quality in the field of parapsychology. You know, a uh, psych psychologist uh, doing a precognition study at Cornell is uh, considered no better than a you know storefront fortune teller somewhere. I mean, that's almost literally the rhetorical pattern that these folks have um, brought into the culture and brought into uh, cyberspace. So it, none of this is the result of any one person. And I'm aware that the passing of a person means the passing not only of an intellectual figure, regardless of whether it was someone who I liked or disliked, approved of or disapproved of, it's the passing of a spouse, a man, a family member, a friend. So uh, I don't have any particular uh, um, flourishes to offer, you know, about the passing of, of James Randi as a man, he had his social ties and commitments just as I do, just as all of you do. So there's reason to mourn alive in any such circumstances. However, a legacy is another matter altogether. And with his passing, we have the opportunity to reassess what I think has been an intellectually atrocious legacy and a very deleterious legacy, a legacy that has made it difficult for serious people to engage in exchanges like this one tonight, for serious people to be able to talk about the anomalous, the psychical, the extraterrestrial in ways that don't require uh, defending from a, a chorus of detraction. That's chiefly uh, the man's intellectual legacy. Some people ask me about the timing of the piece. Now, I'm not insensitive to a person's passing, but I take very seriously, as I was alluding, that we all have family ties, we all are social beings. Um, but I felt that it, it was important for the timing to occur uh, in the midst of all these other LGs and tributes because we needed to have a memorialized document of dissent from the vast, vast array of uncritical uh, tributes that uh, began appearing uh, since uh, Tuesday of last week. And, or rather Thursday. And it's interesting. I won't say too much about this, but it, it warrants a brief word. Um, the piece that I wrote about this man's uh, legacy and career, uh, which I won't describe in any great detail because it's, it's still up today. It, you, you, you can find it at Boing Boing. You can find it on my social media. It's called The Man Who Destroyed Skepticism. Um, a lot of people thanked me for writing it, felt that finally it uh, gave voice to the people who had been really brutalized uh, by uh, Randy and his, uh, his most immediate admirers. And uh, a lot of people were hostile uh, towards my having written it. And the hostility was telling because um, there was a level of bombast that I think would shock you even in our internet age. We are accustomed to bombast uh, on social media, TV news and all that sort of thing, radio. We live in an age where bombast is pretty normal. Uh, even as such, you know, the, 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 the level of hostility and the, the tone uh, in which it was written was so uh, vindictive that it would suggest a chord had been struck. And I think the chord was this. Um, Randy and his followers have a great deal of difficulty in understanding themselves in a manner that is opposite 
of their own self-conception, which is as anti-intellectuals. And many of them are, in fact, anti-intellectuals, which is, is borne out by this uh, chorus uh, of um, vindictive and, and ad hominem language that you'll find in many of their responses. Consider this. Media all over the world, some of which I've mentioned, uh, ran uncritical uh, accounts of his life. This was one exception, one exception. And it was unsustainable to them. There, it was greeted with a level of fear and hostility that was suggestive, that was suggestive. If you're that threatened by one voice, one voice amid a wave of media coverage saying this person's legacy was actually negative. This person's legacy was actually not one of intellectual inquiry, but of the obstruction of intellectual inquiry by and large. To be that threatened by that critique is suggestive. To bring a level of a chorus of hostility using uh, invective uh, is, is suggestive. And it suggests to me um, an insecurity in the uh, polemical position of materialism. Um, those who would defend materialism, and again, when I say materialism, I mean the philosophical belief that matter creates itself and there's nothing outside uh, what we would define as the uh, conventional sensory experience, nothing. This doesn't cover the basis of life anymore in the 21st century. It's what Charles Fort in his own way, and he was quite an individualist, was pushing back against in the early uh, part of the 20th century. And in a certain sense, in a certain sense, the world belongs to Fort more today in the early 21st century than it did 100 years ago. And I say that because um, we have a body of psychical research that is now about 80 years old. We have a body of experiments in quantum mechanics that are now over 80 years old. We have emergent fields like neuroplasticity, which demonstrate that sustained thoughts actually affect the neural pathways, the pathways through which electrical impulses travel in the brain. That field is now probably about 20 years old, give or take. We have a real remarkable unfolding of uh, new studies into the placebo response conducted over the past uh, 10, 15 years or so that demonstrate the efficacy of everything from placebo surgeries to a triggering of the placebo response in an atmosphere of transparency to measures of there being a placebo response, even when subjects are given what is considered to be a effective uh, pharmacological substance. In other words, the benefits or the effects of the drug are are changed uh, for better or worse based on the information that the subject receives about the drug. In other words, there's a generalized placebo response that seems to be going on all the time. We also have other just extraordinary questions such as very, very rare, but persistent cases of spontaneous remission of terminally diagnosed cancer. I, I write about this in my book, The Miracle Club, uh, where I write about the work of an Australian uh, researcher and psychiatrist named Ainsley Mears, uh, who in the 1980s uh, studied whether there was any correlation between intensive meditation and these rare cases of spontaneous remission of cancer. And Mears found about a 10% a correlation. And I may talk about that a little further uh, this evening, but I write about that in my book, uh, The Miracle Club, and I have an excerpt from The Miracle Club, which I posted today 
to Medium, which is called How to Talk About Contentious Issues in Science. How to Talk About Contentious Issues in Science, in which I highlight the work of Ainsley Mears. Now, Mears was meticulously careful, as I try to be, not to uh, in any way exaggerate or overstate uh, this data about spontaneous remission of terminally diagnosed uh, cancer. I am talking about an infinitesimally small number of cases, but these are real cases and these are documented cases. And about 15 such cases occur each year among new cancer diagnoses here in the United States. It's an infinitesimally small number. It should never be used in a sensationalistic way or in a manner that's suggestive of any kind of miracle cure or to give false hope. I cannot state that plainly enough. However, infinitesimal as this data is, it's also persistent. It's also documented. It occurs. And Mears, in his work, found a correlation in a small but not insignificant number of cases between intensive meditation and cases of spontaneous remission. It would be a mistake to draw conclusions from that. We don't know what's going on. There could have been a misdiagnosis of cancer in the first place. The patient could have had a virus that suppressed his or her immune system. And when the virus lifted, the immune system was able to combat the cancer. The individual could have had a suppressed immune system for some other reason. But those who have documented these cases in mainstream medical journals, and you can find the references in the Miracle Club or in the article that I referenced, did say that another category that simply cannot be discounted is the psychological. What a shame it would be. What a shame it would be to neglect this material altogether. This is why, although there's not a direct connection, I believe that the style of polemical skepticism that Randy and his followers introduced into our culture has made it difficult to discuss these issues and yet discuss them we must, or we're neglecting a question. We're neglecting a question. I remember I was talking about this question of spontaneous remission one night several years ago with a cancer researcher at Harvard Medical School. He specialized in breast cancer. And I described these numbers to him and I made it very clear to him the depth of care with which I wanted to discuss this material so as not to exaggerate it. And he said to me, look, I have to be objective, but I can tell you that my colleagues and I have noted to one another that a person's treatment does seem to respond to the attitude that the individual has towards his or her treatment, and we don't know why that is. I framed all of this in a fashion as carefully as I possibly could, as carefully in writing as I'm trying to frame it now in speech. And another research physician that I knew got very angry and wrote to me and said, you know, you're proffering miracle cures, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, we are framing a question and taking pains to state the rarity and the anomalous nature of this phenomena, but nonetheless to point out that it occurs consistently. It's documented. It's persistent. It's not testimony, although I don't discount testimony. It's documented. So, and yet, there's this quality to the intellectual style that prevails within many institutions today of closing down these questions, however delicately they're framed. I oppose that. I stand against that. That's why I wrote the article that I just described. That's why I will, as is pertinent, 
continue to uh, write or speak in, in such areas. We need to be able to find a way to discuss anomalous phenomena that is neither sensationalistic nor denying of questions. I cannot be plain enough about that. It is a basic human impulse to ask, what's around the next corner? What's over the next hill? That's never going to go away. We'll all be in a lot of trouble if that ever goes away. That impulse cannot be curbed when facing questions of anomalous phenomena. And I, 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 I use the term anomalous generally. If we're encountering something over and over and over again, either in what could be considered valid testimony, in other words, coming from people who have no diagnosable issues, who are describing phenomena that's very similar, who describe this phenomena over a period of time, that's a record. That becomes a record. Testimony is very valuable. There's all kinds of things in life that depend upon testimony. For example, personal pain or psychological anguish. We have no scale exactly that we can put this stuff on to measure. If you go to a hospital and you'll say, I'm in pain, you might get shown a chart of frowny and smiley faces and asked to identify on that chart uh, what your emotional state is to apropos of the pain you're experiencing. It's testimony. How do we understand the workings of uh, psychopharmacological drugs, SSRIs and such? You know, it's testimony. And I'm being conservative about this, you know. Is the placebo effect involved? These are all important questions and they matter. But if we take at face value that there's benefit from these drugs, and I believe there is, I believe there is. Um, the manner in which we measure that benefit is testimony. We don't even fully understand the physical workings of these drugs. So, you know, another term that you'll hear from kind of the polemical skeptical community is uh, that's just anecdote. You're speaking an anecdote. Well, what's the difference between anecdote and testimony? You know, usually it's a political one. Usually it's whether or not the observer likes what's being described or at least uh, validates the uh, query that's at hand. So I take testimony very, very seriously. But some of what is referred to as anomalous phenomena in our world today is more than just that, which brings us to the UFO question. It's really extraordinary. I mean, it may seem like I'm bursting through an open door to say that UFOs have now gone mainstream. I mean, we've had evidence, documentation, and a record of testimony in the modern age going back since the end of the Second World War. So it's not like any of this stuff is new. What's new is that the information that exists, particularly the visual information, I'm thinking of these uh, cockpit videos. We have uh, three of them that are fairly recent and compelling. Among others, this information, uh, while it had been leaked through various back channels in the past, is now transparent, out in the open daylight, has the official approbation for what it's worth of the Department of Defense. For some people that raises a whole concert of other questions, and I understand that. But I'm just speaking in terms of where we are on the public scale. And these videos appear uh, not just in links to you know, articles by people who are ardently interested in studying UFOs, but on the front page of the New York Times, on the homepage of CNN, on various news pages at legitimate uh, news sources all over the world. Here we are looking at cockpit videos of UFOs, hearing the voices of aviators saying, wow, what is that? Literally. And the DOD saying, we're going to study this. There's a whole host of other questions that might accompany what I'm describing in brief. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we have gone through a door that doesn't revolve the other way. UFO studies are now part of the mainstream, whereas as recently as 18 months ago, 
they might have been definable as anomalies. Now, this puts us on the precipice of uh, a question. And actually, we've been standing on this precipice for, for many decades. What are these things? What are these extraordinary, unidentifiable, clearly not just naturally occurring, but engineered objects? What are they? Are they visitors from another planet? Are they some form of technology that we haven't grasped or understood? I'm friendly uh, with the UFO theorist uh, Jacques Vallée, and Jacques has been an influence on me and many others in this regard. And I think um, Jacques' uh, theory of UFO phenomena is one that has uh, aged well in an age of, of quantum mechanics, and I'm going to describe it. In short, uh, Jacques' uh, contention is that the distances uh, between Earth and uh, other presumably habitable planets are so great that there's an unlikelihood, at least based uh, on our theoretical understandings, that spacecraft could just kind of hop the pond, the cosmic pond, uh, so, to, so to speak, and, and make their way to our terrestrial sphere. The distances involved, the speeds required, the uh, jumps in time uh, required are so awesome to conceive of that a couple of generations ago, uh, he deemed it unlikely that these a craft that could be visiting us uh, just across the expanse of the cosmos. Although there may be ways in which that expanse uh, can be bridged through black holes or uh, time gaps or other phenomena. And Jacques' uh, theory is that uh, extraterrestrial sightings are more likely to be interdimensional, that in fact, based on the theoretical models we possess, it is simpler to work out uh, an interdimensional thesis than it is to work out an extraterrestrial thesis. And this theory has aged well, because right now, for example, uh, one of the interdimensional theories that has become uh, widely talked about within our own generation is so-called string theory. And to put it in, in, the, in the briefest of terms, uh, string theory is the supposition that all matter and all events occur along a series of undulating strings that crisscross through what we experience as reality. And that these undulating strings are populated uh, by different dimensions of existence. And sometimes we don't see the antecedent of something that happens within our experience of reality that might be triggered by something that belongs to another dimension that exists along one of these great strings, so to speak. And it's interesting because it can explain things that our physical models have not yet been able to explain. For example, the so-called mirror effect. Isaac Newton made the observation that objects, uh, both infinitesimally small and macro, seem to mirror one another in motion at extremely far distances. And he wondered, why would that be? As we entered the 20th century and the study of quantum mechanics, got underway, scientists discovered that this mirror effect that Newton had detected in the above ground, so to speak, macro world, 
also occurred in the particle world. So we see both particles and macro objects affecting one another at a distance in ways that we can document but not explain. So string theory, for example, could be an explanation of why we're seeing these tandem effects without any discernible cause. It could be, it could be that the cause exists interdimensionally. So we just don't see the antecedent for what's going on. Quantum mechanics introduces all kinds of extraordinary questions to us, which also suggest the existence. In fact, you could even say require the existence of a series of different realities. We know for a fact, due to interference patterns in quantum experiments, that a subatomic particle appears in an infinite number of places at once. It's called superposition until a measurement is taken. When a measurement is taken, the particle collapses from a so-called wave state to a particle state. It gets localized in one place. But without a measurement, there's no localization. The particle remains a possibility and not a particle, a wave, so to speak, and not a localized object. And there was a physicist named Hugh Everett in the 1950s who arrived at a many worlds theory of quantum physics. Everett was responding to a thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat. And I won't go into it in any great detail because I've spoken about it other times and in other places, but the Schrodinger's cat experiment in brief holds that when you take a measurement basically and you localize a particle, you have effectively created a whole past, present, and future because you made a decision to take a measurement and effectively to localize that particle at that moment in time. If you take your measurement on Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. mountain time, the measurement itself has fostered a reality. There would be a different reality if you had taken that measurement at 2.01 p.m., a whole different past, present, and future, a whole wave of different possibilities accompanying that one event, which leads us to reason. In fact, it necessitates that we reason that there are and that there exist a whole vast infinitude of possibilities going on, not only in potential, but coexistent, coexistent. You would have to allow for the fact that there are all kinds of coexistent realities occurring within a kind of a wave state scenario, possibly. And only those that reach our awareness are the ones that we call actual, real experience based on the how, when, where, and why that you as a sentient observer have taken a measurement. Now, of course, I am speaking about events that occur in a particle lab where somebody might be directing a subatomic particle at a double slit system or some other kind of target system. These are things that occur within infinitesimally small micro settings. But I'll say two things. A law, in order to be a law, must be consistent. So natural laws that we encounter, like gravity, are ever operative. The experience of gravity might change dramatically based on your circumstances. Gravity responds to mass. In effect, you could almost argue that Gravity is mass being attracted to itself. So if you were on the moon, you could jump 10 feet in the air. 
on Earth, on Jupiter, you know, the weight of gravity would crush you. It responds to mass, the mass in that case of the planetary body. If you were in space, you would experience uh, a vacuum, the absence of gravity. It's still there. It's still going on. If it didn't, everything would come apart, you know, in a certain sense. But it's experienced differently. So uh, to say that, you know, what we're observing in the particle lab is exclusive to the particle lab would violate how we understand natural laws. They're ever operative. What else is a natural law? But they're experienced differently based upon circumstances. Now, circumstances are such that when we take a measurement in a lab setting, let's say we're using a microscope, for example, just to use that as a, um, a model. When you're looking through a microscope, you see more and more of what's actually going on. You know, if you take a drop of water and you just look at it, well, you know, what is it? It's, it's clear, it's viscous, it's you know, it's our sensory experience of water, but you put that same drop of water under a microscope, there's all kinds of things going on. There's little single cell life forms in that drop of water. There's bacteria in that drop of water. You keep looking and looking, that drop of water itself is made up of particles. You keep looking and looking, the particles have space in between them. It's extraordinary. But as you pan back, you get less and less information of what's actually going on. There are a school of quantum theorists who call this information leakage. And so it may be, it may be that when we measure things in exquisitely fine ways using exquisitely fine instrumentation in the particle lab, we see reality. We see what's really going on. And then when we measure life using our own senses, things coarsen and we see less and less of what's really going on. William James in his 1902 Gifford lectures, which later became the varieties of religious experience, he wrote about this. Quantum physicists uh, don't credit him, um, but James actually wrote about the same phenomenon. He said the mystic sees things as though he or she is looking under a microscope and the rest of us have a, a coarse and reduced vantage point. And quantum physicists make essentially the same theoretical point and say, look, you know, extremely fine instruments just mean that we see more of what's happening. And when we pull back, so to speak, we see less and less of what's happening. So the phenomena of the quantum lab, which has been documented for over 80 years, if it's real, it has to be general. That doesn't mean we always experience it. We don't experience gravity in the same way. We don't experience magnetism in the same way. We don't experience electricity in the same way. Depends on the conductor, depends on the circumstances and so forth. But it's always there, it's ever operative. And what, what are our senses? But natural technologies, biological technologies of measurement your sight, your touch, your smell, your taste, your hearing, you're measuring things. You're measuring things. These are natural technologies of measurement. Not entirely different than what the scientist is using in his or her lab to augment, to increase the fineness of our sensory abilities. Is it possible, is it possible, understanding that all of this is generally true, by which I mean ever operative, that we, the individual, may be experiencing these interdimensional encounters at moments of exquisite sensitivity, or put another way, perhaps fortunate accident. Perhaps there are wrinkles where we gain the benefit of some improved sensory capacity in ways that we don't yet understand, but that we are able to document through localization of an object in our own horizon of experience that might otherwise exist only in potential. And in the same way that we are capable of documenting the localization, measuring the localization of that collapsed object 
in the particle lab, so are we capable of documenting the localization of that collapsed object on a macro scale within our own frame of reality. And that's what gives us the experience of and the video documentation of UFOs. I take the extra interdimensional, the interdimensional thesis very, very seriously. Why? Because we can get our arms around it. We can get our arms around it. What I've just described, albeit in rough terms, does coalesce with more than 80 years of quantum mechanics. We can get our arms around it. There's a device, a mental device that many of you have heard of called Occam's razor. Occam's razor holds that the simplest solution that covers the most bases is probably correct. So although there are different suppositions that one could make for uh, UFOs reaching us from across the cosmos, and that's a discussion worthy of having, it may be that if we're following the dictates of Occam's razor, the simplest solution that covers the most bases is probably correct. The interdimensional thesis holds up extremely well, it seems to me. So I, I want to really put that out there to you. And it's something that's it's worth learning about. I write about quantum physics uh, in my book, One Simple Idea. I write about it further in The Miracle Club. And uh, I write about these things uh, more explicitly as it relates to tonight's discussion in an article called Reclaiming the Damned, which has the same the title, but not necessarily all the same themes as tonight's talk. You can find that article at Medium, but it'll give you a chance to dig a little further into what I'm suggesting. Now, what I'm suggesting could also extend to the experience of anomalous uh, or undocumented uh, beasts or humanoids like Bigfoot, you know, for example, or uh, Aleutius. Uh, or fairies, you know, leprechauns. You know, these are things that we use these terms um, so colloquially that they can sound kind of silly. You know, there was a critic who said about me, you know, Horowitz is an okay historian, but the guy believes in leprechauns for Christ's sakes. And it's, you know, I suppose you could say that's a fair criticism. Um, I mean, it's tough, you know, because we use language like leprechauns or ghosts or what have you. And, you know, when people use that that kind of vocabulary, uh, they're usually using it, you know, in a kind of uh, poking font, you know, at the whole thing. I mean, I've had people say to me, like, you know, you want to study the existence of ghosts? And it always sounds rather silly, like, you know, I'm a member of the Scooby-Doo cast or something. Um, but the fact is, you know, are we prepared to conclude? Can any of us conclude? that there's no extra physical survival. I mean, if you want to call that ghosts, obviously, you know, it sounds a little bit like Abbott and Costello in a haunted house. But if you want to talk about the question of after death survival, can anyone respond to that? This is another reason why ESP research is so important to me. And I want to circle back to that right now. You know, simple things can be just the most incredibly revealing uh, can place us in front of questions that are just extraordinary in their scope and their scale. You know, uh, people will always ask me, have any weird things happened to you? Do you have any bump in the night stories, Ouija board stories, levitation? Very, very little that's weird, you know, ever happens to me. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the you know, I'm like the ancient mariner who's forced to walk the earth, you know, describing, but not always able to touch. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not one who documents or talks about many weird things that happen to me. Um, maybe the lights will flicker while we're, you know, getting together this evening. But I can assure you that would be a signature moment, you know, in the weird life of me. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't experience much, you know, that I could could talk about in the way of phenomena, but it's not important to me because I don't really chase after that stuff. Um, I'm not disparaging of it. It's just not really something that's been part of my life or search. But I try to get across to people 
that some of the simplest, most seemingly elementary things themselves open up or can open up in all kinds of extraordinary directions. And this brings us back to ESP research. You know, even the most rudimentary foundational ESP research of the 20th century puts us in front of the incredible, puts us in front of a, a vast expansiveness of questions. I am a great admirer uh, of a man who some of you may have heard me talk about uh, before or have, have read my writings about, and that is a psychical researcher named J.B. Ryan. J.B. Ryan and his wife and intellectual partner, Louisa, founded uh, one of the first scholarly parapsychology labs in, that, in the United States at Duke University in the early 1930s. Uh, J.B., because of a uh, sympathetic college president at the time, was able to found uh, the Ryan Labs for Parapsychology at Duke University, an organization that continues today as a, a not-for-profit lab uh, off campus, uh, continues uh, J.B.'s work. Um, and J.B. Uh, and his collaborators, uh, you know, starting in the early 1930s, engaged in a, a long-standing a string of uh, ESP experiments, JB really helped to popularize the term ESP, that involved a, a five-suit deck of cards uh, called Zener cards. And this five-suit deck of cards would probably be recognizable to some of you. You've seen it on Ghostbusters and in other places. It has a, a circle, a squiggly line, a cross, a star, square, you know, very familiar, simple elementary uh, figures. And uh, JB and his colleagues conducted tens of thousands of trials with different subjects where they would ask the subject to uh, basically try to guess at uh, the, the various cards that were being laid down, which the subjects could not uh, view, which were out of sight to the subjects. And the basic facts are that over tens of thousands of trials really rigorously juried and meticulously structured and conducted trials that were safeguarded against any form of uh, pollution or corruption of data or bias of the experimenter. Certain individuals consistently demonstrated an above statistically average ability to name the upturned card. So for example, you have a five suit deck of cards, statistically over a certain number of trials, your guess rate is going to even out at about 20%. And as much as we have laws of statistics, that's one of them over a certain string of trials, eventually, if you're making a, 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 a one in five guess hit on cards, it'll even out at 20%. Well, JB and his collaborators found over tens of thousands of trials, there were individuals who, for example, might get a 30% a hit rate, a 32% hit rate, a 33, 34, 35% hit rate. It wasn't the equivalent of Zeus throwing lightning bolts at Earth, but it was a real effect. It was a violation of the so-called law of averages. It was a violation of the statistical absolute that eventually averages had to even out and assert themselves. This wasn't true. And this effect was documented for years and years and years and years in every conceivable kind of setting. Now, uh, self-styled skeptics will tell you today, and you will read on Wikipedia and other places, these experiments have never been replicated. These experiments had all kinds of statistical pollution. Uh, JB didn't report his null sets or his zero sets. None of this is true. None of this is true. The experiments were replicated. JB reported all of his data. 
and safeguards were taken, juried measures were taken that excluded any reasonable possibility of pollution in the data. I touch on some of this in the article that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our, our exchange. It's very important to understand this because what JB's experiments did, these simple but very rigorous and years long study of whether an individual could get an above average hit rate on a five suit deck of cards, it poked a hole in the centerpiece of materialist philosophy, which is that your mind is strictly an epiphenomena of the gray matter of the brain. It demonstrated that there is some extra physical capacity, some non-local capacity to intelligence, that we are able to glean information in a lab setting that exceeds our ordinary physical understanding. Why is this so important to me? It's vitally important to me because once you have established that there's an extra physical quality to individual existence, or at least provided statistical evidence that is suggestive of such, you are upending the idea that we are just machines of flesh and bone. There's a materialist philosopher who says human beings are nothing but moist robots. It's a pretty phrase. It doesn't hold up. It's yesterday's news. The fact is, we cannot just be moist robots. We cannot just be uh, beings of flesh, bone, and ordinary motor function if we're able to glean information in ways that demonstrate an extra physical transmission. What is the extra physical transmission? You know, JB never theorized that. I think that was a flaw in his work, and I love this man. He didn't feel like it was his. Uh, imperative to theorize a delivery system. He felt it was his imperative to assemble so much statistical evidence that it had to be heated. Well, I think that, first of all, one of the difficulties, I think, of JB's life was that he was a more principled man than his critics. And I say that with melancholy. It's a difficult fact of human nature. People like JB don't come along very often. He was a man of such meticulousness and honesty and decency. And he was so conservative in his efforts. He would never extrapolate beyond what the statistical uh, evidence uh, provided. But it was his conviction that if he provided enough statistical evidence that there was an anomalous transfer of information in juried laboratory settings, eventually the critics would have to say, yes, there's something there. But what the worst of the critics did is they played move the goalpost. This is one of the things that James Randi engaged in as a routine device. And you'll see the same thing among some of his most ardent followers today. Move the goalpost. No matter how valid the information, it will be denied. There will be some dog ate my homework reason why it can't be right or arguments will just be repetitively replayed even though they've been responded to. JB would respond to all of his legitimate critics. Other critics would come along, ignore the response and replay the same old arguments. And why? Why? I think it has something to do with a sense of safety. You know, we all politically and otherwise, we want a world in which we feel safe. It's human nature. It doesn't belong to any one political tendency or outlook or another. It's inside of all of us. It's inside of me. I've had the experience many, many times, as I'm sure all of you have had, where somebody will announce a political position or a social position, and I feel the adrenaline, you know, rising up inside me. We like to think we're these rational beings. I just want the best policies, but politics, money, love, sex, intimacy, it's all emotional, you know. We respond to what makes us feel safe. I could defend whatever you know, policies I want, but at the end of the day, there's a little being inside me that just wants to feel safe. And I think that's true for all of us. That's why you know, political discussions get out of hand so quickly. That's why there's so much invective online. It's not because you know, 
we're arguing about the rationality of this or that policy. We're arguing very often about what makes us feel safe. So th there's something in the upending of materialism that makes certain people in our culture feel very unsafe. And once in a while, once in a while, they'll concede it or they'll give hints of, of why that is, you know, and I understand where they're coming from because their feeling is, well, hey, you know, if you start hearing news that this Duke University researcher has proven the existence of ESP, it's going to uh, usher in a whole new age of irrationality. And, you know, next thing you know, we're believing in unicorns and so on and so forth. And that's their fear, you know, in a nutshell. That's their fear. Well, there's lots of irrationality in our society, and they haven't done a very good job at pushing back any of it. They have done a good job of denying funding and academic approbation to wonderful, wonderful scientists like J.B. Ryan or others like my friend Dean Radin. They've done a good job at that, but that seems to me about the only thing they've done a good job at. We're not... Um, burden with the over surplus of rationality in our society today. So I don't think their approach has kept them as safe as they would like to think it is. I think a better approach, a healthier approach is to say, let's ask questions in a way that's meticulous. Let's use the method of science to pursue questions that are reasonably and thoughtfully sustained as JB's experiments unquestionably have been. I'm describing the first earliest generation of ESP experiments. I mean, you know, this is like the Wright brothers, you know, uh, flight at Kitty Hawk. I mean, this is really early stuff. But the Wright brothers did demonstrate that we could engineer flight, right? Well, several generations later, humanity is going to the moon. I'm talking about the equivalent of the Wright brothers in terms of parapsychology. There were a series of experiments that, that, that followed uh, uh, JB's work. Uh, there were many experiments, but one class that's very important is called the Gunsfeld experiments. The Gunsfeld experiments were conducted by a scientist uh, named Charles Onerton. Not him alone, but he was one of the primary figures. And Onerton uh, wanted to experiment with what we would call um, telepathy, mind to mind, so called mind to mind communication. And Honerton found that if you could take the individual and if you could put that person into a, um, a position of comfortable sensory uh, deprivation uh, and induce a deep relaxation, usually through putting an individual into uh, like an isolation tank, fitting him or her with headphones that might emit white noise, comfortable um, eye shades, you could induce that person into a deep state of relaxation that is sometimes called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia is the state that you experience just before drifting to sleep at night. You're very relaxed, very comfortable state. I've written about that, talked about that in other contexts and settings. So Onerton uh, experimented with placing people into this very comfortable, relaxed state of hypnagogia. They would probably be inside some sort of a noise-sealed sensory uh, depro tank. One of those tanks still exists at the Rhine Center. And if you ask me very nicely, I'll put up pictures of myself tonight in that depot tank. Um, and another individual, another subject uh, would be outside the depot tank. And the other subject who might be referred to as the sender would attempt to mentally send mm, pictures to the subject, the receiver, so to speak, in the tank. And anyway, Honorton, like uh, his mentor, uh, J.B. Ryan, conducted tens of thousands of trials. And again, if somebody, the, the, the sender seated outside the tank, was attempting to mentally convey one of five images to the receiver inside the tank, again, there was an above average hit rate again and again and again. Now, here's where things get interesting. Honorton man of great integrity who died very young, collaborated with a, a skeptic, an avowed skeptic who's still living, uh, a man named Ray Hyman, who's a, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. They collaborated on a paper uh, in 1986 in which it was unprecedented that a, a parapsychologist and a avowed uh, recognized skeptic 
collaborated in this way. It hasn't been repeated since, which says something about the impoverished na nature of inquiry in our culture. Um, the two uh, researchers collaborated on a paper in which Hyman, the skeptic, agreed that uh, Honorton's data was uncorrupted, was unpolluted. It was legitimate. Hyman maintained that he did not accept the ESP or telepathy thesis. He did not accept that thesis, but he agreed that there were grounds for further study. That's all. That's all. The two men, presumably possessed of opposing viewpoints, agreed that there are grounds for further study. You don't have to accept the ESP thesis, but we do have a statistical model based on uncorrupted research that demonstrates the anomalous transfer of information in an extra physical way in a laboratory setting. You may be asking yourself, as I've often asked myself, why didn't these kinds of collaborations continue? What happened? 1986? That's the last time that this kind of collaboration occurred? And by and large, the answer to that is, is yes. And that's a tragedy. So I'm not joking when I say to you that uh, our culture has lost at least a generation of ESP research due to the efforts of what I would call polemical skeptics or what the a sociologist Marcello Truzzi referred to as pseudo skeptics. It's a terrible loss to shut down this kind of information often by way of invective and campaigns of uh, invalidation an unwillingness to just say, hey, let's look at the data. Let's look at the information. One time, an uh, anthropologist from the University of Kansas was saying to me, hey, we shouldn't be wasting the taxpayers' money on this stuff. You know, you know. He's a professor at a public university, so he's benefiting from the taxpayers' money. And I said to him, listen, this research costs peanuts. It's peanuts. It's really next to nothing. Consider what I'm describing. You know, some guy sitting in the equivalent of a broom closet, you know, putting you into a, a sensory deprivation tank, you know, somebody, you know, constructing card experiments. Obviously, you know, I'm speaking of things that are over a generation old. There are other more sophisticated experiments that go on now, some of which are conducted by my friend Dean Radin, who's the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Northern California. Dean uh, conducts a series of precognition experiments. And in these precognition experiments, in brief, Dean will uh, show a subject a variety of images that might elicit a physical response. They might be violent images that are deeply disturbing. They might be uh, sexually arousing images, whatever the case is. They're images that, that elicit some sort of a measurable physical response. And Dean has found that among certain subjects and in a meta-analysis of pools of subjects, uh, physical response rates such as salivation or perspiration or the release of adrenaline or what have you, uh, uptick of pulse, certain physical, uh, these physical responses to the images um, as a matter of meta-analysis, a pooling of, of all the data, occur just milliseconds, milliseconds prior to the showing of the image. Not in every case and not among every subject, but among a notable uh, pool of subjects, enough so that the overall whole is uh, affected. Again, this shouldn't be happening. Why is a, a certain subject having a physical response to an image in, in an infinitesimal moment prior to being shown it? Now, of course, again, the the polemicists will say, you know, bias of the experimenter, polluted data, so on and so forth. You know, they set the scale back. And this is what I mean by moving the goalposts. You know, Honorton and, 
and, and Hyman in 1986 established the possibility of collaboration between parapsychologists and skeptic, at least to the extent of avowing the validity of the data, if not agreeing on the, the mechanism. But we've lost that. We've lost that, that progress. And we lose a precious, precious inquiry into the human situation. Temporarily. A question is indestructible. Maybe the only thing in life that's indestructible. It will reassert itself. It's reasserting itself today. We may not in this generation see a reopening of uh, ESP research in the way that I believe it, it ought to occur in a properly funded way. And again, the funding involved, I mean, we're talking peanuts. Uh, I'm speaking to you about, you know, some of the, just the, the basic core experiments. They're absolutely remarkable. There was, and, and no longer is, uh, a parapsychology lab at Princeton University called the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. And one of the experiments that, that the Princeton lab, which no longer exists, unfortunately, engaged in uh, was through the use of devices called random number generators. Random number generators are devices that spit out a completely random infinite series of, of numbers or symbols. These are the devices used, for example, to come up with uh, new passwords each time you, you log on to some sort of a new uh, website or, um, or app. And random number generators emit an infinite pattern of completely randomized lights or sounds or uh, numbers or symbols. And the Princeton lab attempted a, uh, what might be called a global consciousness experiment, so to speak, in which they placed random number generators at different points around the globe. And the Princeton lab in short found that immediately preceding, during and following the events of 9-11, patterns appeared where there shouldn't have been any in these, uh, some of these random number generators that were dispersed throughout the globe. There was a signal in the noise, so to speak. There should be a completely chaotic uh, emission of information. That's the point. But within the chaos, there suddenly appeared a pattern immediately preceding during following the events of 9-11, which suggested I mean, again, you know, this is making a, a, a kind of theoretical leap, but it suggested the possibility of some sort of a global intellect. The ancient Greeks called it nous, you know, just to, just to draw a, a, a supposition uh, that, that, that could be measurable in a statistical pattern, the emergence of a pattern where none should exist. So again, you know, these are just experiments, but we have data. We have data that sustains a question. It's much more than testimony, although I take testimony very seriously. I'll get emails, uh, I'll, get, I'll get dings on social media. Is there a single paper documenting the existence of ESP in an academically juried journal? Well, of course there is, of course there is. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of them, which I've just described a few of, and they've been published and they've been repeated. But this information will not be accepted yet, presently. 18 months ago, UFOs weren't widely accepted. We're speaking uh, October 28th, 2020. Maybe 18 months hence, something will have happened. I don't know. But we certainly live in remarkable times. The deep, deep divisions that we uh, feel politically in this country and in other countries, the trauma that has been visited upon people uh, through the COVID crisis, the fallout of that in health and economics, they're putting all of us under a terrible strain. And I take that with the deepest seriousness. But periods of intensity can also be periods of just remarkable shifts in perception, consciousness, art, culture, intellectual output. I don't like the fact and I don't wish for the fact that uh, crises spur innovation. 
But uh, as the poet William Blake observed, opposition is true friendship, by which he meant that it is through opposition that we grow, that we expand. Nietzsche put it a different way. That which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Now, that may seem like a very romantic and blustery statement, but in a certain sense, he and Blake were getting at the same thing, which is that tension, friction, is the cause and the price of creativity. And we are going through very tense times today, and that's to be taken very, very seriously. We're going to have an election in a few days in this country that everybody is justifiably on edge about, and there's no joke about this. But the fact of tension historically, and I think as, a fa as, as, as an aspect of human nature, is growth-oriented. It's harrowing, and I don't wish for it, and I don't wish for it for anyone, but it is growth oriented. Without demands and friction, we would remain intellectual and emotional children, both as individuals and as, as a culture. So there are all kinds of possibilities opening up today in which these damned facts might be entering more and more into the mainstream. I've talked to you about uh, UFOs entering mainstream culture, something that can never be reversed. I've talked to you about some extraordinary, if deeply rarefied, questions uh, within medicine that can never be reversed. I've talked to you about uh, theories of uh, interdimensionality with regard to UFOs and other anomalous so-called uh, phenomena. Um, I have spoken to you about the work of J.B. Ryan and Charles Onerton, other pioneers uh, in ESP research, uh, more contemporary figures like uh, Dean Radin and the, uh, the clinicians who until recently ran the uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab and what that suggests about an extra physical existence. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to have a guarded sense of possibility that these questions are going to open up in a new way in our time, in a new way in our time. I think there is a, a distinct and likely possibility that we are reclaiming the damned in the Fortean sense of that word. There are facts that are ne neglected, excluded, argued out of existence that are reasserting themselves in our generation right now. It's extraordinarily exciting. And I want to leave you with a closing thought before we go into uh, an exchange period, a question and answer period of, of which we have a, a time. And it is this, you know, when a great deal of energy is being unleashed, and we usually use the term energy metaphorically, and I'm not so sure that it's entirely uh, metaphorical in the way I'm about to use it right now. When a great deal of energy is, is unleashed, when we're actually able to see statistical evidence of some extra physical or some potentially interdimensional occurrence within our experience, I ask you to watch very, very carefully for what's going on in your life and what's going on in our broader culture. Because there are possibilities that are being unleashed today that may lead us to new vistas, new junctures, new sources of insight, not only as a culture, but as individuals. And I ask you to watch for this within our broader society and watch for this uh, within the intimate confines of your own life. And I thank you very, very much. And I want to turn it back over to Matt Parker. And uh, we have time for uh, exchange discussion. And I I invite you to please raise anything, ask anything. Uh, we're here to search.
Thank Mitch, you. thank you. That was phenomenal. And you mentioned uh, Jacques Vallée a little mm -hmm. earlier and, and his book, Passport to Magonia. Oh, you have it there, eh? Okay. Yeah. Great book. Yeah. I need to reread it because I was just absolutely blown away with it. And I know he has another follow-up book. I believe it's called um, Enca Encounters or something. something along yes, uh, Confrontations. Confrontations. And Jacques also has a series of books. I think it's, I think it's four volumes, and it's called Forbidden Science. And believe it or not, it's a series of diaries. And you would think, wow, it doesn't sound that exciting to read somebody's diary. But Jacques reinvented uh, the literature of, of, of publishing memoirs or diaries in a way that's really readable and accessible and exciting uh, to the individual. And uh, this, this particular form of writing hasn't been popular for a long time. You know, it used to be that French generals would write their memoirs and, you know, these 11 volume set of their encounters, you know, during the Napoleonic Wars or something. And we don't really go in for that kind of reading anymore. But Jacques published this, this multiple series of diaries called Forbidden Science. They are enthralling reading. And in them, he expands upon some of the ideas that I've been talking about. But Passport to Mongolia, uh, Confrontations, a variety of other books, I, I, I I heartily recommend them. Well, I brought up Passport Magonia because Jacques makes some very interesting uh, connections in there. He, he talks about the stories of uh, leprechauns or little people or yes. people who be humans being abducted and taken to an underworld. Yep. And the experiences are incredibly similar to the description of, uh, descriptions of UFO abdu abductions. So I believe the first UFO abduction recorded um, or reported was 1960, around that time. Yeah, the modern, yeah. modern, right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, after the sci-fi era exploded yeah. and you have all these movies, that, that's what <clears> became <throat> ingrained in, in the pop culture mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how people interpreted these experiences. But prior to that, it was, you know, the leprechauns or, or these uh, mysterious right. little people abducting people and actually take them to underground worlds, or maybe other yes. dimensions. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, Jacques has also uh, produced uh, in our time are great uh, correlations between modern close encounter testimonies and uh, ancient or pre-modern uh, testimonies. You know, Jacques' contention is that what we call the close encounter story has been going on since time immemorial. We just called it by different names. You know, so we might refer to certain beings in the Bible as Nephilim or, you know, giants or, you know, use terms like fallen angels or demons or demons or, you know, any number of other terms that might be associated with biblical antiquity. You know, people in, in different parts of the world, cultures from Polynesia to Siberia have their own stories of little beings who, you know, might within the Irish or Celtic world be called Alushas or fairies or brownies, uh, um, leprechauns and so forth. And uh, Alush is a term used in Latin America. Um, so, you know, we have all these different so-called world myths and, and yet, you know, he's drawn a correlation between these stories and uh, modern close encounter testimony. So he does that in Passport to Magonia. He also does that in a book of his that I published back in my publishing days called Wonders in the Sky, which uh, Jacques co-authored with a, a writer named Chris Aubeck. And uh, Wonders in the Sky is a catalog of uh, UFO sightings, basically before uh, we use terms like UFO or extraterrestrial going back to antiquity up through the, the modern age. Okay. Well, let's lo open it up. Does, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. A number of you were emailing questions in to me, but I think uh, Mitch would much rather hear you uh, ask your question in person. Matt, I have a question for Mitch. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Mitch. My name is uh, Darcy Staniforth, and I'm an um, uh, uh, American Studies scholar. So I mm -hmm. study the how and why of American history and culture. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about tonight made me think about, I wonder, like, as Americans, we love binaries, right? We love yeah. gender binaries. We love all these binaries. So right, it makes right, me right. wonder 
if you feel that um, part of people's hesitance to have more gray area in their life is because culturally we have been so designed and taught that binaries are, are, are where we find our answers. That is such a wonderful observation, uh, and I really, really, truly applaud it. I think nothing is probably more limiting of the human inquiry than, than binaries. Uh, we're, we're forced to think in these, in these terms that are just close us off to so much, uh, including within our own psyches. You know, I mean, I, I, I think everyone has the experience of going to see a therapist, for example, and thinking, you know, I've got to get fixed, you know, and I got to straighten this out. And, you know, it could be that the responses that we have that might be diagnosable in one sense are actually very helpful or very necessary in, in some, some other sense. You know, it used to be that, uh, I don't know, you know, it's funny. I mean, somebody, um, like, for example, I have uh, noise sensitivities. So, of course, I decided to move to New York City, the quietest place on earth. And, you know, these noise sensitivities can be heavy sometimes. Um, I have to adjust for them. You know, I mean, sometimes they're just things I have to do, uh, situations that I have to modify or take myself out of. Now, if it were, I don't know, 80 years ago and we didn't have a diagnosable description of noise sensitivities, you know, I would probably be told, this is all in your imagination, you know, it's all in your head. And, you know, the, the truth is, I have to learn to cope with other people, other people have to learn to cope with me, and somehow I navigate my noise sensitivities. Now, that's just a very, very, very small example of a much larger issue that you're talking about. And um, the, the, the great stakes of what you're talking about is that we as a culture and as individuals are disabled from sustaining questions. It is such a tragedy. It's such a tragedy. You know, what I always say to different groups of people is, you know, you can't, can't you find one way of sustaining a question without it making you feel, you know, endangered? You know, here's a, here's a political example I'll give. Um, years ago, I was writing a piece about the uh, television evangelist Oral Roberts, who's been dead for many, many years by now. And I, I think there are some things that were very interesting about Oral Roberts and that I wanted to share in this article. There's aspects of Oral's career that I wanted to highlight, even though I am not in political or religious sympathy with him. He, as a figure, was a really interesting man, cut from a, a kind of unique cloth. And so I wrote a profile of Oral, and um, it was uh, all set to get used in a uh, conservative religious journal called First Things. It had been accepted. Uh, the online editor was uh, very positive about it. He asked me for a biography and a picture. Usually when they start asking you for a biography and a picture, you know, you're pretty much the deal is done. You know, it's past the mustard and we're about to eat. And then everything went silent. And long story short, I couldn't get him or anybody else to respond to me. And finally it became clear that culturally there was a pushback against the piece. And so I had to take it and go somewhere else with it, which was okay. Although I kind of felt they could have just come to me right up front and said, look, you know, sorry, but this marriage is just not going to work. And anyway, you know, I bring this up because I thought to myself, look, I'm from, you know, the alternative spiritual world culturally, you know, uh, we're not simpatico, I get it. And I'm not asking for you to look at things my way or, you know, I'm certainly not gonna look at things your way, but couldn't there be just one encounter? You know, couldn't you find one guy from the new age culture who you can talk to? Just one encounter, you know, you don't have to like take a summer share with me, but just, you know, just once. And, and the answer too often is no, you know, so we do this to one another politically, we make it impossible for there to be a dialogue with just one person from outside of whatever my perceived tendency is. And I hope I don't do that to people. You know, I think sometimes I might when somebody comes to me with both guns blazing and then, you know, my response is, is in kind, you know, but my wish is never to uh, um, cement myself or another into a kind of binary possibility. And, you know, again, I'm speaking on this personal scale, but the point that you're making is so macro and so important. And it's why, for example, the research that I'm talking about gets so stymied because there are just so few instances in which somebody could say, look, I don't agree with the ESP thesis, but I can evaluate your data and I think your data is uncorrupted. So 
let's keep asking a question. And because it's not financially prohibitive, there's no reason not to ask the question. And, and yet, how rarely that occurs. So I think you've put your finger on, it's the fissure point of our time. And uh, um, we will not be able to successfully exchange as a, as a human community uh, uh, unless we get outside of that, that false binary that's, that's, that, that's brought to bear on us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I have a, I have a, uh, I don't know if it's a question or, or a, a question plus a statement. Um, and, and who's speaking? Um, it's John MacArthur. Sorry. Oh, and I'm, hi, I'm located. I'm located in uh, Western Canada, uh, in Alberta. Now the the, the question uh, relates to, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, there was a researcher who did a considerable amount of work in uh, alternatives. Uh, in terms of religious faith, a uh, fellow by the name of Evans Wentz. Mm -hmm. And he wrote uh, a uh, interesting volume called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, a fairly substantive volume where it talks about these types of issues of uh, abductions and, and encounters with different types of beings. Although he never uh, went into the question of extraterrestrials, uh, mm -hmm. it was more along the lines of the, the underworld and the, and the extra world, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering um, if uh, any of this has uh, resulted in any of the, the studies that uh, you're talking about. I have heard of the book. Um, I don't, I have not read it, you know, so I don't know his work. I, I, I have heard of it. It's a gap in my own, in my own reading. I, I would certainly like to check it out. You know, I know there, there, there have definitely been folkloric uh, studies and analyses and accounts that I think must have figured into uh, the work of later writers, including Jacques Vallée, uh, who said, hey, you know, we're starting to find parallels here. And I'm always fascinated with parallels. I'm fascinated with parallels, not only in human testimony, but in philosophies. You know, you've got somebody who grew up uh, in rural settings in the mid 19th century, say in Massachusetts, you know, who by way of his or her own private experiments comes to insights that might coalesce with certain aspects of Vedic thought or might coalesce with aspects of Hermetic thought. And, you know, there's no obvious family tree uh, of connection. You know, uh, you could theorize that there's some numinous connection or you could say, well, look, you know, the truth has a funny way of asserting itself. You know, sometimes there are these parallels and insight among people who are separated by vast reaches of time, geography, language, culture. And, you know, when you encounter those uh, parallels, I think that's the scent trail of, of something truthful. I, I, I always encourage people to follow that scent trail. So I will explore his work and um, I, I appreciate you raising it. Yeah, uh, he also was involved with uh, some of the work around the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Oh, no kidding. That's yeah. fascinating. Maybe. That's fascinating. Quite a, Please, feel free to email me about it. You know, my email is on my website, MitchHorowitz.com. It's my real email. Um, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't believe in like, you know, people not making themselves available. So just, uh, you know, drop me an email about it if, if, if you're so inclined, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mitch, I had a question. Please. I see uh, it's Charles. What's your name? Um, Charles. Yes. Fitzpatrick. Hi. Hi. Um, huge fan of yours. I've read a lot Thank of you. Books too, um, but the, you know, obviously this year I've had a lot more time to read. So I've been. <laughs> right. Haven't we all? Great <laughs> backdrop, by the way, Charles, I don't oh, know if yeah. people watching this can see, but Charles has the backdrop from the end of the first, uh, the original Planet of the Apes movie. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge hit on my uh, conferences. So right. uh, no, great for our yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, so I had a few, I had two questions if you, if you'll, uh, indulge me. Please. Uh, and so can, I, I have read like the valet and I, I've read a few other books about like Bigfoot and whatnot. And I do think mm -hmm. the this phenomenon is kind of like where it's at, but I was wondering, um, do you see any differentiation between the theories of like alien tech slash governmental cover up, the abduction, you know, experience and, or the consciousness phenomenon, you know, are those kind of like coincidental or differential instantiations of this like. Right. And do they contribute to this misunderstanding of the underlying 
phenomenon, right? Because I, I think there's a lot of like conspiracy theory that kind of interrupts the discussion. Yeah, it's a tough question, and it's one that I wrestle with all the time. You know, I mean, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. You know, it's like the the field of of ufology, for example. I think has, and I'm going to generalize. I think it's been heavily uh, dominated over the past uh, several decades by a great deal of um, anger-based uh, conspiracism. And I am sympathetic to uh, the researchers who feel a deep sense of frustration that perhaps the government is not uh, coming clean with all the, uh, the data. And there are researchers who feel that what I was describing earlier, the Pentagon's release of the cockpit videos, you know, officially, you know, the stuff was kind of leaked before, but, but, but the official release and the announcement of a new uh, initiative to study UFOs, you know, some of the ufologists feel like, you know, this is just a, a front for uh, the militarization of space and so forth. And I mean, I, I have so many different feelings about this, you know, it's, it's hard for me to encapsulate all of them. I mean, first of all, I, I think it's important for all people to uh, take a victory lap now and then to mark our victories. It's important for environmentalists. It's important for UFO folk. You know, um, the Hudson River here in New York City where I live is much cleaner than it was, for example, when I was growing up. Uh, and I'll occasionally mention that to somebody who will say, oh, yeah, well, it's still this and that and the other thing. And I'm saying I'm not counseling complacency. I'm just saying mark off progress because it's important for human morale. We can clean an urban river. It's doable. Let's note that and then do better. You know, it, it, you know, I don't want people to resist marking off certain victories. So I regard the whole UFO thing, uh, the, re the release of the cockpit videos, the new initiative as, as having aspects of a, of, a, of a victory, which you can probably tell from my description. There are many people who chafe against that, you know, because they feel like the, uh, there's, there's a more nefarious backstory. And it's hard for me to speak about that because, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not a ufologist. I mean, I, I care about the field. I participate to a degree in the field, but I'm not immersed in it. And so, you know, I can't speak authoritatively about every uh, uh, nook and cranny of it. I just cannot. Um, I am concerned in general about the conspiracist mindset in our culture. And what I mean by the conspiracist mindset very simply is a persistent style of thought that seeks after a hidden adversary, a style of thought that sustains itself by the uh, positing of a, a, a binary, you know, as Darcy was, was alluding to, to, to a have not, an outsider, an adversary, an enemy. And very often where conspiracism uh, goes is the identification of that enemy uh, among helpless groups of people, you know, and that's what the witch trials were, you know, going back uh, centuries in Europe. Um, that's what the satanic panic was uh, here in the United States uh, or North America, you know, in the, in the 1980s. You know, it, it's, it's, the, it's the epitome of irony in a certain sense that, you know, for example, um, we have had serious problems in the United States um, with, with the abuse of, of children, the sexual abuse of children going on within mainstream organizations. The Boy Scouts of America uh, has declared bankruptcy to shield itself from survivor lawsuits. This is not imaginary. And yet, you know, the QAnon conspiracy theories and stuff, you know, would have us redirect our gaze to these uh, entirely, you know, imaginary pockets of, you know, pedophilia among, you know, uh, so-called uh, Satanist, a term that's, that's undefined and poorly defined and, and very generally used. And next thing you know, you know, the, the, the adversary is being identified uh, either among imaginary groups or among groups that have no political power and are thus easily marginalized, which is a, a very common repetition within human history. So, you know, conspiracist thinking, which I define as a, a model of thought that sustains itself by the continual search for an enemy, um, is something that I feel a very profound caution about, you know, in the, in the 21st century. At the same time, that doesn't mean that there aren't cover-ups. That doesn't mean that there aren't uh, failures of disclosure that need to be exposed. So there has to be a way 
I mean, we could do a whole other evening on this. There has to be a way where we could, you know, ask these questions in a manner that doesn't uh, cement us into the binary mentality that we were talking about before or cement us into uh, the persistent search uh, for an enemy or that doesn't uh, 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 require the humiliation or objectification of other individuals or communities, all of which I, I attribute to, to uh, streams of conspiracist thought today, but there has to be a way to sustain these questions. I mean, I want to hear uh, from, from people in the UFO community who have serious questions about failures of disclosure. I care about that. But I also have to know that those questions are coming to me in such a way that they're not part of a patterned way of thought. They are a, 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 a sustained, um, uh, well-justified, well-structured set of questions uh, that are also willing to be proven wrong, that are also willing to be proven wrong. You know, I mean, you can tell from what I say that I take the ESP thesis very seriously. I, 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 I believe in the phenomena of ESP, but I would rather be wrong a hundred times over than shut down a question. I could live with somebody saying to me, look, you're wrong about the ESP thesis, but there's a question there. So let's pursue the question. That's okay. You know, I don't have to be correct about every facet of it. You know, so there has to be a way to address uh, the question of disclosure that doesn't cement us into a kind of um, us versus them mindset. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, it is. Can I, can I, I have to ask one more. Please. Yeah. Yeah. The, big, the Bigfoot thing. I mean, yeah. differentiation between like conscious, conscious phenomenon versus like flesh and blood hypothesis. People yeah. Need searching for like poop and hair in the woods. Right. What's your take on the Well, you know, yeah. there was an MD today who uh, wrote something uh, slightly contentious about me. And he said, hey, you know, he was making reference to the Bigfoot thing, which I think is how we should hereafter refer to it. And he said, hey, you know, no DNA, no evidence. And I understand that, you know, but the truth is, uh, you, you know, you're denying a record of testimony. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, if you're going to exclude records of testimony, then you could just as soon say that we have no evidence for the effects of any number of, of pharmaceutical drugs, including SSRIs, all of which is based on testimony. We don't fully understand the physical mechanism by, with, by which all of these drugs work. And so we, we use results-based records to determine their efficacy. You know, records, our evidence, you know, testimony over a period of time becomes uh, admissible evidence. Um, we recognize this in the criminal justice system. We recognize this in the sciences. We recognize this in therapy, you know, and we wouldn't have psychology. We wouldn't have social sciences if we didn't recognize that testimony is, 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 is a, a record of evidence. So, um, you know, we have all this testimony, uh, the times we live in are such, you know, there could be DNA evidence, uh, you know, next week, you know, for all I know, uh, there may be DNA evidence that hasn't been properly understood or evaluated. You know, it's funny. I remember 10 years ago, I was at a conference at the Esalen Institute and uh, it was an invited group of people who study the esoteric, the paranormal. And uh, we were talking about UFOs and somebody said, look, um, we live, you know, in the West in a very materialistic society and people are just never going to buy the UFO thesis unless, you know, we got it on radar. You got to see something on radar. Well, 10 years hence, we have things on radar. We have incredibly vivid uh, cockpit um, uh, recordings and we got it, you know, we got it. So these things can also change uh, very, very quickly. Mitch, uh, Brent Nobles asked a question over in the chat. Uh, his audio or, or mic is not working, but he uh, says, uh, first, thanks for uh, taking on this topic directly, and he hope, hopes you continue. He said, <laughs> Harvard psychiatry, uh, psychiatry professor John Mack coined the term ontological shock to mm -hmm. describe the difficulty uh, many purported UFO experiencers have reckoned with the phenomenon. Uh, if we assume a national security expert like Lou uh, Elizondo claim that the public has only been uh, public has only been 
privy to a very small slice of the data available to governments, I'm concerned that disclosing too much too soon could lead to mass PTSD. Mm. Um, as an emerging thought leader uh, in space, how would you advise the powers that be on disclosure? Do you think the world could handle an unvarnished truth, even if that truth included uh, some of the more uncomfortable rumors about ET or ultra terrestrial involvement and long term human evolution uh, are probably, or excuse me, provably true. Well, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I don't think the powers that be uh, are interested in my counsel, but I will. Uh, I'll do my best to 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 suggest this much. Um, you know, I remember uh, years ago. Um, I was having a discussion with someone uh, at a professional lunch and was talking about um, the uh, evidence that had been found for uh, microbial fossils, the fossils of microbial life on Mars. And I said, you know, if this stuff turns out to be true, you know, it's just extraordinary. I mean, we're finding an instance of extraterrestrial life, or at least past instance of extraterrestrial life, within our own solar system. I mean, that's mind blowing, mind blowing. And the person I was having lunch with said to me, you know, I, I understand intellectually where you're coming from, but it doesn't really blow my mind. I mean, I don't really feel any different. I'm going on my morning commute, I'm doing my laundry, I'm stressed out about this, that, and the other thing. And I said, well, you know, that's true in the space of, of, of the ordinary um, trappings of daily life, but give it time, you know, give it, give it time. You know, the, the realization that uh, uh, life is general to our solar system in some form or another, the realization that there's an extra physical uh, quality to life can uh, be extraordinarily upending, even if ordinary routine goes on. I mean, look what our ancestors in the Victorian age uh, must have experienced uh, when Darwin's theories of evolution you know, came to hold sway. You know, people who had been raised in childhood maybe thinking of this hierarchical universe of, you know, uh, a creator and, and creation and, 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 and cycles of life that were completely uh, regulated by this hierarchy is suddenly confronted with a, uh, a theory that, wow, you know, human beings developed from, from lower forms of, of matter and it upends this whole hierarchical view of the universe. It changed things. It changed how we see ourselves in so many ways. So I do think that the uh, introduction of ET uh, evidence uh, will change us. Whether it would cause PTSD, I, I don't know. You know, the abductees or those who described uh, abductee experiences to John Mack had gone through terrifying and deeply unsettling experiences that were characterized by suddenness. If you or I don't experience that suddenness, um, you know, it, it may be that the trappings of daily life still feel somewhat reassuring, you know, and the change will be more uh, subtly uh, felt, you know, uh, which doesn't mean that it won't be profoundly felt. I mean, the Victorian, you know, who, who was told that, you know, humans developed from, from lower so-called, you know, forms of life, you know, he or she had a changed point of view on things. Look, you know, that's been the whole story of modern culture in a certain sense, you know, if you were to describe modernity, you know, modern philosophy, what would that really be? I, I'd say it's, it's the uncovering of unseen antecedents. You know, so for Freud, for example, it was uh, childhood trauma and the subconscious. Um, for William James, it was the religious uh, experience or the experience of the extra physical. For, for Einstein, it was time and matter, relativity. For Marx, it was economics. For Louis Pasteur, it was germ theory. You know, all these different modern figures in the West uh, said, hey, you know, there's an antecedent here that we haven't understood. So it could be that, you know, the search for extraterrestrial life uh, will become such an antecedent, you know, that uh, now we understand, wow, you know, life is general to the universe. What does this say about our religious point of view? What does this say about our bio biological point of view? It challenges so much. And yet all those figures that I just mentioned and more, you know, they challenge so much. But but life did go on, you know, within its normal everyday demands, which 
have a kind of stressful but also calming uh, function. So it seems to me that people who have extraordinary experiences do suffer PTSD. And I, I've witnessed it some people, I believe, and um, uh, including my friend Whitley Strieber. I don't think he would mind my talking about it. I mean, I remember once um, you, you can draw your own conclusions about Whitley's body of work, but uh, I don't think he would mind my talking about this publicly. Um, at the same conference that I mentioned at the Esalen Institute, Whitley was there and he was uh, out on a balcony somewhere looking out over the Pacific. And I had just read Whitley's book, uh, Communion, which is a book I admire very much and encourage people to read. And um, I wanted to, you know, go out and say hi to him and, uh, you know, tell him that I had just read Communion and, and, uh, and I admired it. And I walked out on the patio and I said, Whitley, and he jumped, you know, I mean, he jumped. And I thought, wow, this is a man who's symptomatic of PTSD, you know. I don't think he would mind my saying that. Um, I've talked to him about it. You know, so, so people who have these experiences, whatever they may be, uh, do, do suffer that. But for the rest of us, I, I don't think that the introduction of dramatic new knowledge necessarily, you know, would, would result in, in trauma. You know, it could be more subtly felt, even though it's, it's really seismic. Mitch, in, in a few of your books and other conversations, uh, we've talked about the, the power of the human mind, uh, being able to uh, basically think things in reality. If you believe and you focus and, and that energy mm -hmm. uh, bringing forth reality or manifesting the reality, could some, not all, but some of these uh, phenomena that we're seeing be a uh, manifestation of, of some of the energies or some of the thoughts or some of the fears or, or superstitions that, that people have. And, uh, you know, now we're seeing these things that we've never seen before, uh, you know, in the world of quantum physics, or when we talk about uh, ufology or other, mm -hmm. uh, what mainstream would call a pseudoscience or woo-woo science. Mm -hmm. But could right. there actually be a, a human element in there where maybe we're, it's a cause and effect. I think that's a wonderful observation. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I thought one of the mistakes of J.B. Ryan's career, and I, I love J.B. Ryan and I honor him, but I think one of the mistakes of his career was that he never attempted a theoretical model of what was happening in, in ESP. He never attempted a, a, a model of, of transmission. And um, there was a um, mathematician and a um, foundation executive named Warren Weaver, who wrote to JB, and I write about this in the Miracle Club, and Weaver, who had visited JB's lab in the early 60s, said, uh, listen, um, I think the work that you're doing is valid, um, but there will never be acceptance of uh, your work uh, within the scientific establishment until you come up with a theory of transmission. And JB said to him, uh, I don't think that's my responsibility. I'm, I'm a statistician. You know, my job is to create a, a body of evidence. I leave it to somebody else to engage in the metaphysics of how this occurs. I personally thought that was a mistake on JB's part. And I thought Weaver had an important point. So I asked myself, although I am not a scientist, I asked myself, do I have a theory of, of, of transmission? Do I have a theory of a delivery system? You know, apropos of what you were just describing, I've written a number of books and I will write more uh, on the question of mind causation. I take seriously the, the thesis that our minds have causative properties. Although I also hasten to add that we live under many, or we experience many different laws and forces. And, and it's not the only game in town. That's why I, I don't use the term law of attraction I don't personally use the term manifestation because I, I think there's a disclarity to it in the same way that when 19th century writers used to just make reference to the soul without defining the soul, you know, as if it was just a settled matter, <laughs> I thought that was really unclear. And there's a lot of good philosophers who I thought hit a brick wall because they would use the term soul without ever defining it. So I asked myself, what's going on? Or what can I at least propose as a supposition that other people can um, consider? Uh, so I use the term selection rather than manifestation. And I, I, I raise the question, is it possible? Is it possible, apropos of what I was describing earlier, that if our, um, if our sensory organs are tools of, of measurement, 
and you know what else are they? Then, in the same way that 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 a perspective measurement uh, in in the particle lab and and in other settings uh, determines what is localized, is it possible that the same kind of selection as exercised through perspective, emotional proclivity, assumption results in the localization of an event among an infinitude of events within the horizon of our own experience. Is that the truth behind Neville Goddard's statement? An assumption, though false, if persisted in, eventually hardens into fact. Now, I think most people, to some greater or lesser degree, uh, would, would uh, nod in, in, in sympathy with that statement. Is it possible that that statement is really literally true and that there are these acts of selection going on all the time and we don't see them because they feel very natural that as as in the events in the schrodinger's cat thought experiment which i haven't described but which i've written about in many places um there is the creation of a whole sense of past present and future around the act of selection so it feels very natural it feels very natural you know so if you matt are experiencing something you could say, yeah, I live at, you know, 21 Elm Street. I've always lived at 21 Elm Street. Well, the very act of selection brings with it a, a multi-dimensional uh, texture and vividness so that, yes, it feels as natural to you as the chair I'm sitting in, you know, feels to me. And so it could be that this is how we're going through our lives. And we don't know this because of information leak, which, as I was describing earlier, but it's in fact uh, the reality of things. Fantastic. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for joining thank us you. again tonight. This has thank been you. Thanks. absolutely fantastic. Pleasure. Few people uh, applauding, uh, thank and, you. and I joined them in that. Uh, again, this was more than I could have hoped for. Just blown away. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank I you all so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll do it again. Uh, if, if you want to reach me, my website is MitchHorowitz.com. You can join me on social media. Twitter uh, is at Mitch Horowitz. Instagram is at Mitch Horowitz 23 and uh, always happy to hear from you. Uh, love doing these evenings and uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh, Joe. Thank you, Josh. Thank you everyone who, who joined us, who, who joined the exchange. Thank you to the North Carolina Masonic Research Society. A real pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you have a great night and uh, like Mitch said, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Yeah. Right on. Right. Thanks very much. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.